participation from uh, the public at some point in their lives. So uh, it seemed like a, a bit of a nice tongue in cheek way to, to introduce what is, is a pretty important measurement for uh, many glaciers around the world. So uh, today we have uh, Daniel Farinati from ETH Zurich, uh, who's been working on uh, all types of glacier uh, thickness and flow and hydrology problems for many years. Uh, Daniel, if you want to say hi and uh, add, any other, add anything else to your introduction. Uh, yeah, so sorry, I didn't caught the last part. Sh shall I say some words uh, for myself? Sure, yes, go for it. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, um, I think you, you said it all. <laughs> yeah, I'm, um, I'm at ETH, I'm uh, leading a group there, and I've spent uh, some time of my career dealing with uh, estimating ice thicknesses. And I believe uh, by now the most uh, famous work is this uh, consensus estimate that uh, ice thickness um, working group uh, of IAX, the International Association of Cryospheric Sciences, came up with, and this is what I'm going to be talking about in a few moments. Okay, great. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, next up is, uh, we'll also have uh, Jack Holt speaking. Jack, I've known for uh, many years, and he's been involved uh, recently and uh, for several years in several types of uh, geophysical investigations of uh, glaciers, and he's been working with Operation Ice Bridge measuring uh, Alaskan glacier thickness, and also thinking a lot about glaciers on Mars. And you're now at University of Arizona. Anything you want to add to that, Jack? Uh, not really. I just, uh, yeah, I've been working mostly with a group from University of Alaska Fairbanks on, but I'll, I'll be talking about it later, but Chris Larson and Martin Trufer. Um, so. Excellent. Look okay. To showing you some of our results. Great. Thanks. And uh, so we've got, how many folks do we have here? Uh, we've got 18 here. I'd first like to uh, just anyone who's new to uh, an IARPIC meeting or to the Glaciers and Sea Level Collaboration team uh, that we haven't uh, had online before, uh, would you like to introduce yourself now, including <laughs> Jack's done so? Uh, I see a couple of names I, I'm not so familiar with. Uh, let's see, uh, Alex Messerly. Uh, Tim, I see you've got, I know you, but you've got a couple of students I don't think I've met before, perhaps. Uh, do you want to introduce them? Yeah, hey, I'm Chris, I'm Tim's PhD student. And then I'm, I'm, a, I'm an ambassador student. Oh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear you, but. Uh, <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I'm Emma, I'm Tim's master's student. Okay, and you were, okay, all right, thanks. Uh, anyone else care to introduce themselves who's new uh, to IARPIC or the Glaciers and Sea Level Collaboration Team? Uh, hi, I'm, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, I'm Lavanya. I'm a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Great, excellent. Nice to meet you. Nice and hi, you. I'm Alex. I don't know if anyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, I'm a remote sensing specialist at the Asiat Greenland Survey in Nuuk. Okay. Okay, great. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, anyone else? We've got, uh, this is Caitlin Florentine. I'm the co-lead with uh, Joe of the Arctic Glaciers and Sea Level Collaboration team. And we've got Shad O'Neill here, uh, Emeritus co-lead, um, and another couple of people, USGS folks in the room who are going to be listening in. So thanks for joining all and uh, thanks to our speakers. And um, unless anybody else has um, any kind of introductory comments. I see lots of familiar names uh, on the list and looking forward to having a lively discussion once our uh, speakers conclude. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. And on the agenda, I think we have, uh, we've got uh, Daniel speaking first. So uh, Daniel, if you'd like to uh, share your screen and we'll take it away from there. We'll probably just, uh, we'll have um, maybe quick clarifying questions uh, at the end of Daniel's talk, but then we'll try to lead into a broader discussion, longer discussion after after both talks. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Sounds good. Um, I believe you should have my screen on your screens now. Is that the case? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah, well, um, thanks, uh, and especially also thanks for uh, for inviting to, to give this presentation. 
which is uh, by no means only my work, but uh, the work of this whole uh, working group that I have been uh, co-leading with uh, Liz uh, Marie Andresen and uh, William Lee. Um, what I will talk about is like set up in three parts. Uh, the first deals with the data we have uh, been collecting, the second with the models which uh, we have been using, and the third part with uh, what has uh, come out of it. And so, yeah, let's uh, let's start with that, which is basically the story on how the glacial thickness database that I hope uh, you have heard uh, by now uh, came to happen. So, basically, and it goes pretty much back in time. Well, once upon a time, uh, well, getting ice thickness data was uh, quite a hard business. So the picture that is there is one of the first uh, drilling uh, done at uh, Jungfraujoch uh, through the backdrop. And so those were uh, a very well watched tre treasure. And uh, well, what you what you would find is uh, what you would have in publication. And uh, getting the original data out of that uh, proves to be pretty tricky. So what you can have there is uh, profiles uh, such as this. So this is something from Yuri Macharet's uh, work um, or actual radiograms. Uh, here's something from Raymond uh, et al. You also have at times uh, distribution maps. So it's in some sort of interpolated uh, ice thickness. Here's something from Julian uh, Downswell. Or then this uh, very famous uh, graph from uh, David Barr, where he uh, put on like a volume estimate of uh, like 144 glaciers, which is not very clear to me how all these points uh, came to happen. Um, and finally, in more recent publications, you also see, uh, see some point data. This is from some colleagues uh, in Austria. So the first step uh, that we did was to try and get everything we could uh, from the literature which is quite uh, a bit of an endeavor, uh, but uh, yeah, turned out to be what uh, is now known as the uh, Glatida, so the Glacier Thickness Database uh, version one. So this map basically shows dots on where um, individual data were collected from. If we were to look at what's in there, uh, I mean, something came together and this database is now split into three, uh, what we call tables. So uh, the T table, this is uh, um, basic information about the glacier and the total volume. The double T table is um, information about distributed thickness, so elevation bands, all these kind of maps. And then the triple T uh, is uh, actual point uh, point measurements. And in the first uh, in the first go we had, so in this version one, there, are, there were about like a thousand, uh, one and a half thousand glaciers. So um, this is not bad, but we know, or the Randolph Glacier Inventory tells us uh, that we have about uh, 215,000. Uh, and so um, the question was, okay, how do we do uh, for, for the other uh, that we are interested in? So the second step was to uh, ask our friends. So basically uh, we asked the people that were part of the working group, uh, well, have you some data that you're willing to share? Uh, and we use those as a baseline to um, come up with a new um, release of the uh, global or the, of the glacier thickness database. Um, this has uh, had some uh, various iterations. Uh, now we are um, at uh, version three, where uh, well the third step was not only to um, ask the people that are engaged in the working group, but also to make a call to the community. So this call was uh, came from the WGMS, so the World Glacier Monitoring Service. Um, by now, this uh, well it has uh, amplified what uh, what is in. There is about uh, five thousand uh, surveys, so from uh, in total uh, for a total of like say four million and data points, most of them coming from Operation Icebridge uh, Nota Bene. So uh, with comparison of the um, first version we had, uh, it's like, yes, say a four-fold increase if we want to exaggerate a bit on the surveys and about the six-fold uh, increase in the, um, in the amount of data points that are in there. Um, this data are in um, the Global Glacier uh, or GTNG Global Glacier uh, browser, which uh, looks like here. And uh, well, amongst the various things that you can click is this glacier thickness uh, database. Um, and well, 
about the information that you can find out is uh, if you are in a particular place uh, when you click go for example and tease out which is the next uh, Glatida glacier and uh, get information from there now this is uh, excellent um, so yeah uh, but uh, we wanted to um, make something that is more useful uh, than, than just knowing where are the points that we were able to collect um, and so the, the glacial thickness database was kind of a cornerstone for the other activities uh, that we uh, that we pursued with this working group. So the second section is about the modeling that we did. And here, like the most visible product that we had was this uh, ice thickness model intercomparison experiment, uh, which I call ITMIX. Um, what that uh, was about, so um, basically we called for models that uh, estimate glacial thickness just from characteristic uh, of the surface. And uh, well, the basic way that those models works, and I imagine you're reasonably familiar with those, is that they rotate around the lag mass conservation. So if that's a cross section to a glacier, you figure out uh, how much uh, throughput you have, figure out what the mass balance is, and then use a glance flow low to invert for that. So how this uh, works in, in practice is that uh, this is a glacier, this is Stone Glacier here in the Swiss Alps. What you do is that you first estimate the um, surface mass balance distribution. This is what the colors are showing. Then uh, you accumulate for every section uh, along the flow line, which is the thing which is shown in blue. Um, you estimate how much uh, volume needs to be put through uh, this cross section section being uh, marked in red. Um, what you do then is that you use kind of Glenn's Lolo or a converted uh, rearranged uh, version of his equations to basically cast uh, ice thickness as a function of uh, uh, of this throughput which is uh, Q uh, which is a function of some um, ice parameters. Uh, what you what you have then is basically an estimate of the ice thickness around this this flow line, and then you extrapolate that in space and get uh, a nice distribution uh, map. Now, by now there have been like a number uh, of such approaches published. Um, Matthew Molinghams is certainly one that is uh, very well known. Uh, Rob, um, Bob McNabb had some, Van Pelt, uh, Gary Clark, uh, and uh, myself uh, has a model as well. So it makes was really about okay, which of those are doing well and which are doing less well. So what we did here uh, is we um, selected a set of glacier where we had ice thickness measurements. So Latina told uh, us where it came from. Um, we retrieved the necessary data, which is easier said than done. Uh, so here it was a collection of data from more than 20 different people and uh, well it's all based on goodwill like uh, can you provide this and that and uh, took some time um, and then we said to the modelers uh, okay here are uh, the information of the glacier only like the surface information without disclosing the ice thickness um, and then told them well can you guess us uh, what ice thickness will be and uh, well, this works surprisingly well in the sense that we are able to attract like 17 different uh, participating models. And uh, yeah, so uh, let's have a look at uh, what uh, came out of that. So maybe a word first on the glacier that we considered. Uh, we had uh, 21 test cases or real world uh, test cases, which are the um, red dots spread around the map. So here we try to spread them uh, across the globe as much as we could. Um, and we had three uh, synthetic cases, so um, glaciers that were generated uh, by a high order ice flow model, um, which then we pretended to be a real glacier. There, it was meant to uh, be in control of everything. And as I said, we had this uh, 17 different models participating to that. What the results look like uh, is uh, here an example for a glacier that is uh, up in the Arctic. Uh, this is our cross section. Um, on the bottom left of that uh, map you have, uh, or a map of the glacier. Uh, the blue point is up, so to the left of that uh, cross section, and the cross section is the red line. And what you see is that uh, there is a surface, and then there is a bunch of models providing different answers. Uh, those um, um, answers are color coded. So not every model considered all 21 uh, test cases. 
Uh, and now we can put uh, some other uh, glaciers. I'm not showing them all, uh, just a couple. And now, depending on where you look, uh, you will see, oh, there are some cases where the models are doing very well. So the uh, red dots, by the way, are the GPR measurements that we had. And then there are other cases in which you will say, oh, well, um, they are all over the place. Um, one important line amongst those profiles is uh, this green line uh, here. So that's the average uh, composite. So we take any kind or every uh, results that we have got, uh, we take that and we do the average of that. And if you look at the individual sections where the green line comes uh, to, to lie, or, um, comes to happen, it looks like, okay, even in the cases where the models are all over the place, uh, the average of those seem to convert somewhere um, where, um, where the actual measurement uh, like. So basically the main outcome of this it makes mod, uh, uh, model into comparison was to say there is not really a best and or a best model, uh, but it looks like if you have a model ensemble, you, you will be able to get reasonably results. Um, and so, well, then we thought, great, uh, so let's do the next step. Now we have learned we need another uh, a go a model ensemble, so let's go uh, global scale, because at the end of the day, what we want is to have an estimate for every single glacier across the um, globe. So what we did is, uh, well, go back to the same modelers, um, ask them yet another favor, um, and we said, we want uh, you to participate if you are able to handle at least a thousand glaciers. Um, which not only uh, not all models uh, were able to do. So we are left uh, with uh, five models that would um, be capable of handling such uh, such a large number of, uh, of glaciers. And then it went the same way as in ITMIX. Uh, so um, we generated input data or provided input data to the modelers. Again, easier said than done. Now it's really uh, for all uh, of the glaciers including, uh, included in the RGI. And then again, uh, collect, compare, and interpret. So what came back uh, looks like that. This is uh, for one particular uh, glacier uh, in China. Uh, the results as they are given by uh, the five different models uh, that then participated. So the first, uh, the top row is a nice thickness distribution. Uh, the middle row is a cross section and the, uh, the box plots are just another way to represent the distribution to the very, um, uh, right hand side is the average uh, composite. So in, this is the average of all the models. Now, when we said that we have uh, five models, well, again, not all models were uh, capable of handling all glaciers. So um, this plot, which is um, was in the paper uh, that, uh, that belongs to this, um, uh, to this activity, basically tells which model was able to handle what. So the uh, very far left, uh, this model one, which is the one by Matthias and myself, myself. Well, there we were able to um, uh, to handle them virtually all. Um, and to the very far right, so the one by uh, Raj Ram uh, Sankaran, uh, he was able only to uh, to tease out a, a few that uh, was about the, the thousand to one hundred. Uh, so and glaciers at the very bottom tells you how glaciers were considered considered by which models. Uh, so basically, when we say up to five results, it means that in most cases we had three models. So the, the model one, two, and three, uh, two being uh, glapped up by um, Andrian Zwinsbauer and Hürge uh, Frey, uh, and model three being the one by Fabian Motion, which I believe is also listening. Um, in Greenland periphery and Antarctic, there we had uh, mostly or actually only two models so the one that you see on the left um yeah uh, the results that came out from that is uh, what you may have seen so this is probably the, the central figure uh, of uh, um, for uh, endeavor uh, which is basically telling uh, where the ice thickness on earth is distributed and we considered every glacier beside the um, ice caps um ice sheets i mean um, so the the, um, uh, the circles tell you um, how much the total volume is. The um, uh, lila part is what is what we believe is located below um, present day sea level. So the part of the volume that is not contributing uh, to sea level rise, if you were to melt that, 
and the orange um, orange circle is um, or uncertainty estimate. And well, uh, what comes out is that uh, most of the ice, or yeah, most almost the half of it is located in the Arctic. Uh, the Antarctic uh, has one third of it. Uh, Alaska has a big chunk. Uh, High Mountain Asia has about five percent, and the rest is located in uh, the nine regions that we have. And uh, probably the most interesting number uh, coming out is this uh, new consensus estimate about the total volume uh, of ice that we have on Earth, uh, which turns out to be about 160,000 uh, cubic uh, ki uh, kilometers, which um, uh, has about 15%, which is already uh, located below sea level, uh, meaning that there is potential for about you know, this much, so uh, 30 centimeters of uh, potential sea level rise. Now, if we compare uh, all results or this consensus results uh, to other um, estimates that were, uh, were around, so this is what this uh, plot shows. So our uh, consensus estimate is the orange bar and the other bars are uh, pre-existing estimates. So what we see there uh, is that, um, well, on average, um, our, um, um, our result is uh, lower. Um, by about 20%. But if you look at the individual regions, uh, there are some where the difference uh, are very big. And in the paper, we um, uh, focused on High Mountain Asia because there uh, the difference to like the average of what was around before uh, was very significant. So we found about only a half of that what we, uh, what we used to believe was there. Uh, and so the question uh, is obviously, okay, how this, uh, did, how this did came to happen? What's the reason for that? And uh, well, uh, we tracked that down to be uh, an improvement on the rate of Randolph Glacier inventory itself, because what uh, we used is like the latest uh, version, so version six, while previous estimates was mostly based uh, on version two. Uh, the screen, um, uh, the screen polygons that you see is what the uh, Randolph Glacier inventory version two looked like, and uh, this is uh, the new version of it. And there is a couple of things to note. So, for example, it looks like um, version six contains like previously uncharted glaciers. So, uh, in this case, there is no green uh, underlined uh, the, the brownish one. There is other locations where glacier complexes uh, were resolved. So glaciers were split apart into uh, smaller units. Um, there are um, places where the geolocation improved. So you see that those glaciers are like uh, shifted toward the left, which has a lot of influence in our estimates because uh, that decides on what we are going to provide as an estimate for the surface topography. And clearly, if the polygon is lying on a ridge, which is very steep, we're going to estimate a low rise thickness. And finally, uh, there were some artifacts corrected. Uh, so you see here this, this line going through, uh, which uh, version six didn't have anymore. So I'm just jumping back and forth to give you an idea of what, uh, what happens in between. Um, and so, yeah, so this uh, better outlined uh, meant that we had more glaciers, but smaller one. And uh, David Park tells us how this scales with volume. So we had also a smaller total volume. Um, and in fact, if you look at what happened in the High Mountain Asia, so version six had uh, like uh, 30,000 more outlines, so about 44% more outlines that uh, version two had, uh, although the area itself only increased by 20%. And this is the reason why, uh, why we think this, uh, this big change happened. There's some um, minor improvements that were done as well. So in the DMs that were used, uh, so for example, in Antarctic, uh, where there's also uh, a big uh, difference to previous estimate, where we used uh, RAMP um, as a baseline model instead of Aster, which clearly was uh, an improvement. Um, yeah, this is my final slide telling so what, uh, so what uh, did we learn from it? So. We made the case that, uh, well, with the different estimate of ice volume for high mountain measure, um, we also end up having different estimates for what's going to happen uh, on that regions. So, for example, uh, this is uh, what our former estimates of the uh, Hussein Farinotti 2012 ice thickness would tell us how glacier area would evolve uh, through time. 
and if you pick when we would have lost uh, half of the volume, it would have been like 2077. This is what was all best estimated by then. Now, if we took take the new consensus ice thickness, well, this moved forward by uh, about yeah, a good decade, uh, which yeah, um, let's say has may have some implication. We also did the same sort of analysis to what we believe is the uh, total runoff coming out of uh, high mountain Asian glaciers. Again, here the red is uh, what the previous estimate told us. Um, the lower figure telling us how this uh, total total runoff volume is distributed through the year. So with this uh, peak in, uh, in in the summer months, and then uh, yeah, a projection uh, to add to that so that we see this uh, change of peak. And then what the change is with the new estimate. So the, the blue one is again, the same uh, results just driven by the new ice thickness. And in this case, again, uh, you see that the, the change is, uh, yeah, it's quite a bit in the sense that now we estimate that uh, this uh, volume, runoff volume change in the summer month is no longer 15%, but uh, 24, uh, which you could imagine makes uh, a difference to um, populations thanks to Right, uh, so to wrap the bat, uh, what this was all about is uh, really a, a, a community effort, which was uh, demanding, but also very rewarding. I think the working group was quite successful. Um, we provide this uh, first glacier thickness database, which uh, we hope will be of use not only to our activities, but uh, to activities further to come, uh, and run this um, uh, model into a comparison experiment from which we learned that using um, a model ensemble is better than going for individual models that we then used uh, to generate this consistent uh, estimate for the ice thickness distribution, uh, provide an update uh, on what the total volume inert is, and also making the point that this is very important for the future of uh, some regions. So yeah, uh, I hope that uh, this work uh, of the working group uh, was uh, will inspire other works uh, that uh, go along the same directions, so the sort of uh, community works. And yeah, uh, thank you so much. I'm not sure awesome. if somebody will listening <laughs> because I don't yeah, have yeah. any... Yeah, that was great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I had yeah that you. was great. You did a great job. Yeah, thank that you. Very, very well organized, very helpful. Uh, any quick clarifying questions for Daniel before we move on to Jack? All right, uh, Daniel, I'll quickly ask, um, did you, in ITMIX, did you uh, notice any difference between models that uh, maybe just purely uh, were focused on the, uh, on, on, were, physically oriented, uh, flow oriented uh, in inferring glacier thickness as, as with that inversion that you showed for thickness mm -hmm. versus others that use like empirical area uh, to uh, altitude relationships to infer volume. What was, was one significantly better than the other? Um, well, the, we were able to show that at least we are better than volume area scaling, which was kind of uh, like a really dead and null hypothesis, which is uh, reassuring. Um, yeah. But it was difficult to tease out like uh, why individual models are slightly better than others. There, uh, I must say, um, it has also to do uh, by the study design. So we had this uh, 21 cases, but for example, we failed, and this is something that I came to learn uh, after the first it mix, uh, we failed to say, okay, this is the set that you should focus on if you cannot handle them all. So mm -hmm. what happened is that we were left with some models uh, dealing with those uh, cases, uh, others with them. And so it was difficult to make a into comparison that, that was like, yeah, trustworthy to, to, to figure out. We had an indication that uh, like we were slightly better at uh, handling um, mountain glaciers than ice caps. But also that I wouldn't call that a particularly um, a robust uh, results that came out from, from it mix. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, uh, so to keep, uh, stay on time, we'll, uh, we'll move on to Jack. And Jack, are you re uh, ready to share your screen? I think we have to end uh, yeah, Daniel's thanks. screen sharing. All right. Uh, moving over to Jack.
hopefully. I think Jack is uh, muted as well. Yeah. Ah, OK. Scared. Unmuted and sharing. <clears throat> Sorry, I have a cough. OK, can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. That's yep. good. Yep. Okay. okay. All right. Um, this is part of it. Sorry, just a second. I need to, yeah, I just need to clear something from the screen. Okay. So, first, I want to acknowledge uh, my co authors, um, people I've worked with very closely on this work, uh, particularly Martin Trufer, Chris Larson at UAF, uh, and uh, Couple of my students, Michael uh, Christofferson and Brandon Tober, have been involved in the radar work recently. So this is a picture up on the Bagley Ice Field in Alaska, and this is the uh, aircraft that we use for doing airborne uh, ice thickness th ice thickness measurements, which I'll run through here. Um, <coughs> so this has been part of Oper Operation Ice Bridge Alaska, um, which is the primary objective has been uh, surface elevation change using scanning LIDAR. But then several years ago, um, we started adding uh, radar to get ice thicknesses, bed topography to uh, complement the LIDAR data. So um, I don't probably, I probably don't need to motivate this with this audience, but um, Alaskan glaciers are changing very rapidly. A lot of ice loss has, that has been quantified using the uh, laser data um, and we've seen just flying around every year um, it's very obvious that lots of new uh, proglacial lakes are forming and ones that are already there are growing quite rapidly um, leading to even faster change and um, so <coughs> we have a long record of surface elevation change so we're trying to fill in with ice, ice thickness data where we can get it to better model uh, and understand these glaciers and understand how they're going to respond to climate change and in the near future. So, um, and there haven't been a lot of constraints on ice, ice thickness and bed topography in Alaska. So this is our field area. We basically try to hit all the major glaciers and a lot of the minor ones uh, within a few year period to repeat. Um, so we have a lot of opportunities to do radar, but the flight geometry is not always optimal. Um, so it's pretty challenging. These are the glaciers that we have flown um, over the past uh, decade. And I'm going to show you a few examples um, of our radar work from that. So um, radar sounding in Alaska is a real challenge. I've, I've done a lot of airborne radar in Antarctica, and it's relatively easy there because the ice is very cold. Um, and usually it's pretty smooth, and there's not a lot of crevassing except in the coastal regions and some of the major glaciers. <coughs> But basically, you've got a lot of water, um, a lot of crevasses, a lot of debris, a lot of topography. So it's, it's a real challenge. And we use very long wavelength radar for this. Um, by that, I mean 60 to 100 meters wavelength, whereas most of the airborne work in Greenland and in Antarctica that you might be used to from um, OIB or the Texas group is you know, in the five meter and less uh, wavelength range. So this requires towed wire antennas, um, and that gets a little complicated and um, logistically challenging sometimes. So there have been a couple of systems flown um, that basically um, involve the entire radar system towed behind the plane, as shown in this figure from Conway et al. 2009, um, with the transmitter with antennas connected to it, plus a re receive antenna, and all that is towed behind the plane, almost 200 meters of, of stuff. Um, so, um, Martin Trufer developed one of these radars um, uh, to initially use in OIB work, and we use that for quite a bit. But then we've uh, evolved into a system that um, I started building at the University of Texas and now um, have here at Arizona that is a lot more like the JPL WISE radar, where the, the most of the radars on board and you just have one antenna. <coughs> To the an airplane. <coughs> Excuse me. So there are advantages to both, um, and I'll, I'm going to do a comparison here in a little bit. So ours, um, just uh, 
to describe it briefly uh, for the radar geeks out there, uh, we have 2.5 or 5 megahertz antennas, um, and it's a chirp system. So you actually transmit over a, a, a frequency band, um, which is in our case is 100% of the center frequency, which is, is quite a bit for, for a radar system. So it's basically two and a half megahertz sweep frequency at, at the two and a half megahertz center or the five at five. Um, that translates into a, a resolution in ice of 33 meters for the two and a half megahertz system or 17 meters in ice for the five megahertz system. So obviously we're not going for change detection. We're just trying to map the bed um, and, you know, get ice thickness. But we, we as I'll show you, we, we usually combine the, the LIDAR and the radar to get ice thickness. So some other stats on the radar, which I can talk more about if you want offline. But. Um, so first off, a little, uh, a little lesson in surface clutter because this is a big deal in Alaska. And uh, so we've got a little cartoon here next, which uh, will show uh, what I mean by, about surface clutter. So let's say you've got the radar flying over the surface and then you send an echo uh, or a radar wave it goes down, it bounces off the surface, and then hopefully penetrates through and bounces off the bed at the bottom, but you're also sending energy out to the sides. So you get reflections off the walls of these valleys. And you can get the reflections off the walls at the same time delay as what's coming from the bed beneath the surface. And so it can confuse the interpretation. Um, so how do we deal with this? Um, well, if we have a known topography, and we use a DEM for that, and the aircraft positioning, then we can simulate the surface echoes, and it works pretty well. Um, and then you compare the simulation with the radar data. So I'm going to run through this example from Logan Glacier. On the left, we have a DEM and a flight path. Uh, it starts at the little green uh, triangle over on the right after doing a turn to get online, and then uh, runs down the valley. So on the right is a clutter simulation um, produced from that. So there's, there's no radar data there. That's just a simulation of the echoes coming from the walls um, of the valley. And of course, the surface return as well. So first, I'll um, show you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll compare the radar data with the clutter. Um, but I just want to say this has not been done for some published data sets. And um, there's data that have been released, including in the Vajita database that is completely erroneous because they didn't do this analysis. Um, so here is an example of the radar data from Logan Glacier um, from, one of, from that track I showed you. Um, you don't really see a surface return at the top because of our chirp system and flying fairly low. But you then see something in the data um, where I've shown with these red arrows that looks like it could be a bed detection. So you could just go in and map that and say, oh, there's the bed, there's the thickness. But let's look at the clutter simulation. It looks like this. And then I'm going to flip back and forth a couple of times so you can see how things line up. Basically, it's all clutter. There's no bed detected in here. So if there is any bed return, it's coincident with the clutter and you wouldn't know it. So we have to do this for all our flights, and then we also try to plan flights to reduce the amount of clutter. But if we're, say, flying center lines down the glacier for the laser repeats, then we can't really change the flight path. But if we're doing a separate radar um, mapping flight, then we can fly it however we want, and that sometimes do a better job of minimizing the amount of clutter. All right, I'm gonna run through some examples. Uh, for these different glaciers, um, and um, we will start with Malaspina. So the um, Malaspina Glacier is the large, largest Piedmont glacier in the world, um, and uh, it spills out into this, this coastal plain and uh, has a pretty narrow forelands out at the uh, separating the, the glacier from the ocean. Um, we've seen with OIB surface elevation change data that it's rapidly uh, decreasing um, in areas. And the coastal zone is narrow and ice cored and exhibits signs of collapse. There's a lot of thermokarst. You can see um, ice down in the walls of these uh, thermokarst ponds and in places trees are falling in 
to the sides as they grow every year. So it looks like a very precarious system where the coastal zone could collapse and the glacier could basically interact with the ocean more um, strongly and retreat faster. Um, this is a comparison. We've got data from a bunch of systems here. Um, they're not all exactly the same track, but close enough. So at the very top is, uh, is the UAF monopulse system, uh, the completely towed system, uh, like, much like the Conway all 2009. And it's hard to see here, but you can actually, you can track the surface all the way across and you can actually track the bed all the way across. It gets weak in this depiction, but you can zoom in and see the bed. And it's actually high resolution, um, really nice data. Um, it's just got some disadvantages for, you know, having this whole system out behind the plane. Um, and it's also not flexible. It basically, it is what it is. You can't change the pulse parameters or anything like that. So next down, you've got the WISE uh, two and a half megahertz tone, which is what they mostly used uh, for the data that was uh, published in 2013. Um, so you can see the surface in the bed, it's a little fuzzy. Um, and then our two and a half megahertz system below that, the CHIRP system, and then the five megahertz CHIRP below that, which yields the highest resolution of the CHIRP systems, but is more susceptible to uh, scattering from surface crevasses and debris. So most of the time we use the two and a half megahertz CHIRP system, <clears throat> but in some cases we use the five. Okay, so here's a grid um, over Malaspina showing uh, results from a bunch of flight tracks. And you can see a couple of deep channels going down uh, a few hundred meters uh, below the surface and the ice thickness actually gets up to about 800 meters in these troughs. Um, and then this, uh, just want to point out that down, the red circle down at the bottom there is a little, uh, we call the Lagoon of Doom, which is marching inwards into the glacier um, from the ocean. And then it's basically connecting to one of these deep channels that is very close to the coast. Um, and these are a couple of profiles. I'm going to show profiles for the other examples uh, like this as well. So first off, the, the top profile is from the towards the coast inland, and you can see that deep trough going down below sea level, uh, very close to the to the coast. Um, and then it kind of levels off at about sea level. And then the cross profile from B to B, B prime, um, we have uh, you can see the the thickness. Of the, of the kind of the dome of, of the Piedmont Glacier and then one of these troughs going down well below sea level. Um, and it's a very sharp, probably a fault controlled uh, trough at that point. Okay, so on to Bering, um, which is uh, over the uh, other end of the Bagley and uh, one of the largest uh, non-polar um, glaciers. It's, uh, this is an example. So also it has a very large and growing proglacial lake um, depicted in the picture there at the bottom. Um, and then a profile going down glacier um, there in the upper right, and then the clutter simulation showing that this is a, a you can see that this is a true bed return. Um, I didn't show these for Malaspina. It's, Malaspina is very easy in that regard because there's no topography uh, immediately adjacent except right up at the top. Um, so, it gets down to about 850 meters uh, depth of, of ice uh, in this profile, um, which is well below sea level. And I'll show a couple of plots here. Um, so the top one is going um, a long flow, and you can you can see um, that it's very deep down towards the terminus, a couple of hundred meters below sea level, and then um, so a lot of potential for that proglacial lake to grow rapidly. Um, and then a cross profile of mid glacier showing uh, there's, there's actually a, a trough. Um, this has been known, but um, it shows up very nicely in this profile. And you can see it goes to about 250, 275 meters below sea level, even up at that point in the glacier. Um, now Hubbard Glacier. So um, actually, okay, well, Hubbard's the largest non-polar tidewater glacier. Um, and it's, uh, it, it also advances um, when others are retreating. I'm sure many of you know Hubbard well, um, but it's a very interesting glacier, partly because it cuts off, or it has the potential to um, 
shut off the, the gap there with Russell Fjord and water to build up and have a catastrophic uh, ice dam collapse. So um, also Valerie Glacier comes in there from the, to, from the side to the, the west there and seems to have a role in the uh, dynamics of Hubbard as well. That interaction um, seems to be important. So it's also very heavily crevassed. It's a rapid, rapidly moving glacier. Um, so the terminal lobe is, is a giant morass of big crevasses. Um, but the radar works there. And uh, here's a profile going up the glacier terminus. And you can see it goes very deep below sea level uh, quite rapidly, um, you know, up to 450 meters um, below sea level, uh, very close in there to the terminus. Um, and this is a map of, of several uh, flights. This actually combines some WISE data that we repicked and uh, corrected because they used the wrong surface elevations and then <clears throat> combined with some more recent flights um, to get a, a larger, a better coverage over the terminus. Um, and you can see, um, and then on the right, um, I see Michael Christofferson has been working on a mass conserving bed solution. Uh, he presented this at AGU. Uh, this is the McNabb et al. method. Um, and um, what's kind of interesting is the, the deepest part of the bed, um, the thickest ice um, in the terminal lobe region is, is not really in the center of Hubbard, but it's closer to the convergence between Valerie and Hubbard. Okay, I think that's it for Hubbard. We're going to move over to Kennecott, <coughs> go inland a little bit. Um, Kennecott Glacier near McCarthy. Um, so it's a pretty sizable glacier. Um, so, and it's also got a proglacial lake that has been growing uh, in recent years, uh, quite noticeably. It also has a lot of debris, um, pretty complex system. Um, this is a, there's a, a couple of low level shots of the debris cover, Kennecott, and then the lake, which is, which is like I said, is growing pretty rapidly. Um, here's an example of our five megahertz chirp data. So the track um, on the top, it starts, you know, off the glacier, goes up and then turns and comes back down. So that's all combined in that one radar image at the top. And the red arrows uh, point pretty close to where we, looks like there's a bed return and, and we can see in the clutter simulation that those are not present. So those are indeed true bed returns. And uh, if you turn those into ice thickness data and plot it up, uh, here's an example of just one of those uh, tracks going up the glacier and you can see uh, instead of sea level here at lake level. Um, so coming off the terminus, you get drops um, over, you know, 100 meters, um, around 100 meters or so below the lake level pretty rapidly. It comes back up to a ridge and then it drops way down. So uh, it does appear like there's that there's a great potential for this um, lake to grow quite rapidly and be very deep, which was going to impact the dynamics of the system. Um, so in summary, um, we are able to sound many Alaskan glaciers, especially in the terminal lobes. Um, all the major glaciers that we map exhibit over deepenings and troughs and channels that could facilitate collapse. Um, and we are working on going back and performing clutter simulations for, and reanalyzing re re and repicking all the earlier OIB radar flights, including the data acquired by WISE uh, when they've been able to get hold of it <coughs> and reinterpret the bed picks where needed. And then we're going to standardize, we're working on standardizing all the data acquired by all these radars and then release everything to NSIDC. So it's in a very uniform, easy to use uh, format. So uh, that's it. Um, just wanted to acknowledge funding from NASA. Um, some support from Arizona and uh, operational support from Ultima Thule in particular. And that's it. Awesome. Thank you, Jack. Oh, great. That's a huge set of measurements that you've made and a lot of uh, interesting uh, revisiting of earlier data too. Um, all right. So now we're going to open it up to questions. We already have a couple of questions in the group chat. Uh, one earlier from Lavanya. I, for uh, for Daniel, so I want to revisit that first, and then we also have a question for Jack, and looks like another one coming in. 
Um, so first, let's uh, we'll go back to the question for Daniel because we missed that earlier. Uh, Lavanya, do you want to repeat your question? Or I can read it. I was just curious about the ice thickness information that is available now. Um, and I remember Daniel mentioned that it is available for almost like uh, 200,000 glaciers now. Uh, so does it actually uh, include all the glaciers in the recent RGI 6.0 or, or mm -hmm. th th does not have, it has it excluded some of the glaciers? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> the, the basis is uh, RJ6. Now, if you look very, very carefully, it is true there is not every single one. Um, sometimes when we had the difficulties in retrieving a good uh, surface elevation model, um, the glacier is missing. Uh, I believe there may be, I don't know, a hundred or so that are not in there, but uh, I would be surprised if you pick those that uh, that we haven't uh, had. Yeah, so it is okay. virtually complete. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I was just concerned about the several small glaciers, you know, um, in the Alps and several other regions, like which is like very difficult to actually measure the thickness from them. So yeah, that's why this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, th there is an estimate for for everyone, also the very small one, um, and yeah, then. Other people will tell us uh, how good we were in estimating those, because I mean the the basic idea of those models is that there is some ice flow, and in the very small ones where there isn't any, uh, well then you know well, the, the the thinking that is behind uh, breaks a bit down. The, the models generate uh, some results uh, for them as well, uh, but yeah, I'm not not super sure. Um, maybe if I can add something is that uh, we provide the data for the individual models. So there you could also, if you were to use the data, uh, build your own impression on how confident the individual models are. So if you have five models and they're all over the place, well, you know, um, <laughs> they don't seem to agree very well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, good question. And, and, and Daniel, those questions, uh, I've downloaded some of your uh, geotests for particular RGIs. You can get 25 meter posting geotests for all of the glaciers, right? Uh, yeah, the posting is uh, depending on the glacier size. So they oh, depending okay. on which size you pick, we have, uh, I believe, three different sizes, 25, 50, and 100. This is not for having like the very big glaciers that are ridiculous resolution that you cannot handle anymore. Yeah, but yes, uh, the, those thickness maps are available for any region. Yeah. Great, thank you. All right, uh, so now a couple questions so far. One from Andy Bliss. Andy, do you want to say your question out loud? You're muted right now. Sure, so I just um, was curious uh, for Jack, uh, if you have a map of the surface, um, you showed the map of the surface elevation flights, but do you have a map of radar flights? Um, I've been working or have just started working in uh, Glacier Bay, so I'm curious about um, that area. And then if you have any estimate of the timing of the radar data release on NSIDC. Yeah, that's a good question, Andy. Um, I do not have a map showing all the where all the good radar data is because we still have to get through all the clutter analysis for all the flights. Um, yeah, I, I recognize it's a lot of work. I was just curious. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm really, really hoping this will We'll get through that um, by, I think, sometime this summer. I've got a student now who that's kind of turned into his full-time job, um, but he's got classes this semester. Um, but, uh, but that's the goal. I, I want to get that out as soon as possible. Um, part of the, we're probably going to work backwards because the most recent data is easiest to work with. And then um, and it's probably do a few releases so I'd be happy to let you know when we're doing that, um, especially for Glacier Bay. So part of the, yeah, there's the oldest data that the wise stuff is, is really difficult to work with um, because of some uh, timing errors or, or something that throws everything off and how they use the, assume the surface elevations in places and so, so that, that requires a lot of time. So we probably 
probably end up saving that for last, even though that's been published. So in a sense, it's, it'd be nice to get that straightened out as soon as. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, so next, uh, Fabian had a question for both people. I'm just gonna go ahead and say it uh, for, for both Jack and Daniel. Uh, are, will the uncertainty in the point data, however estimated, whether it's global or whatnot, I assume, uh, or, or point specific, will that be included in Glatida in Glatida version four, if anyone's daring, daring to take that on? And, and, will, and will measurement providers like you, Jack, be providing it? I, I think that's, a, that's a great idea. Um, and we should include in certain estimates. It's, it's a little difficult um, with all the different radar systems to always assess, but I think where we can, we should include those. So we, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to include that in the releases that we send out. Yeah, yeah so um, the Latida format, that, that has uh, like uh, the, the space for scene uh, to fill that in. And I believe some guys have provided that. So uh, recently, um, uh, Johannes Fürst has put together many of the data that come from uh, Ivan Lavrentiev, Paco Navarro, and those guys that have been uh, working on Svalbard. I believe Johannes put a lot of effort in trying to retrieve that information as well, and I believe uh, it is in. But in most uh, in most cases, it's not. And uh, I perfectly agree that that uh, would be super valuable information. Great, thank you. Uh, next, we have from Tim. Tim, do you want to give your question real quick? Sure. Uh, sure. I was just wondering what the source of the um, glacier velocity data that the Glatida data sets use. And then given that many of those glaciers are very slowly flowing and are hard to track their velocities from space, what's the impact of uncertainty in the velocity estimates? Um, on the uncertainty in the ice thickness data. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure whether there's a mix up. So Glatida, the, the database that doesn't have velocity in it, that's uh, only measured uh, ice thicknesses. Um, and the second is for the global estimate there, we didn't use velocities. Uh, the reason being that uh, at the time or even now, there is not a consistent velocity data set that, what, uh, that one could use. Um, so how, this so is how for, do you implement the continuity equation? I think it assumes steady state, correct, Daniel? Is that how you get around? So you solve for the mass conserving, you solve for the velocity that would be associated with the flux given the existing geometry as constrained by the, so all you give the modelers is the digital elevation model surface, is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So um, in that case, we also try to cheek around uh, um, the steady state assumption by, by merging uh, the, um, by considering an, an, an emergence velocity, so the difference between the mass balance and the ice thickness change rate. So we say that this is the quantity we use, uh, but in principle, yeah, you, you need some kind of assumption on, on how the two um, are related together. So, uh, but Daniel, if I recall correctly from your paper, you kind of alluded to the future. Uh, and I, I cannot, uh, when you mentioned global glacier velocities, so it wasn't hard for me to imagine from the conclusion of your paper that uh, a, a future global glacier thickness model will leverage its live, for example, to, to solve for, uh, to, to do a better mass conserving solution. Is that correct? Yeah, I think this, this is the, the way we're going. And I believe, um, and this is something we are reasoning at the moment, uh, we may have even more information than that in temporal changes in flow velocity, uh, because there you have uh, elevation changes at the surface, and then corresponding flow velocity changes, and they should basically directly map into the ice thickness. This is something that we are thinking about with uh, Amuri uh, de Heck. Um, that, uh, that's an uh, idea he had, and I believe that's, that would be the, the next step, yeah. Okay, that's clever. Cool, uh, a question from Martin uh, for Daniel. Uh, Martin, do you wanna give your question? Sure, yeah, Daniel, that's uh, all really impressive. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I was just gonna touch on uncertainty estimates um, in, in the models, in the model ice thicknesses. Uh, 
how are they derived? I mean, you in, in some of your, your graphs, you showed uncertainties. Where, uh -huh. where do they come from? How are they derived? And how much do you trust them? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Um, so for the for the global estimate, what we provide is, uh, or how we uh, we went about, is that we, or we should go back a step um, before. What we used for the global estimate is uh, the information of the glacial surface, as uh, Kathleen was pointing out, and all data that were inside of Glatida. So what we did there is we took the Glatida data set and we split that in, two, uh, in three random um, uh, chunks. And then we asked the modelers to use uh, two out of three uh, to calibrate the model and then provide um, um, an estimate for the third part that we didn't use. So this uh, uh, cross-validation experiment. And this is how we ended up having uncertainty bars for, um, uh, for uh, or global thickness estimates and what we have there is also the model spread so um, we have like these two times so for each individual um, model what we believe is the uncertainty of that model which we then uh, combine uh, for or values that we provide and what you will find on the data set that we deliver that's basically the model spread that we show or actually um no, this is, I don't recall. I believe we don't provide like uh, uncertainty maps uh, associated to every single glacier. What we deliver is really the individual model results and then tell how um, how uncertain those are based on this cross-validation experiment that we did. Cool. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And then uh, the next question is yours for Jack, actually. Uh, that you uh, if, if yours is uh, mine, is it correct? <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, uh, well, you're, you're, you have the last question on the list here, so yeah. you can go ahead. Yeah, I, I was wondering, um, Jack, because you, you showed that you do this uh, cluster analysis, and I was wondering how, how you use it then. So is it something that you have on your side when you're picking the data and say, oh, this is about where the clutter is? Or is it like really like quantitative that you subtract the model clutter from um, the radiograms themselves? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. Um, I get that a lot because um, it, it it would be fantastic if we could just subtract it out, but it's basically impossible um, to completely model the radar and the echoes from the surface because you would have to know the radar properties down to sub wavelength scale um, of, of the surface everywhere to do all the coherent scattering and um, it, it, it basically, you, you would end up creating more artifacts in the, in the subtraction process. Um, and so, yeah, it's basically, it's qualitative, but we do have the timing and positioning worked out well enough that we can directly overlay the two. And so you can flip back and forth and they're perfectly aligned in time and space. And so you can see the clutter aligns, it, it aligns really well. And so it, anything that is not cluttered jumps out. Um, but yeah, and it's subject to, you know, you have to have a person looking at it and interpreting that. Um, so mm -hmm. that's part of the reason it takes time. It takes, it takes yeah. more time. But it's the same case even for like the Mars orbital radar I work on. Um, we're sounding from space and sounding through the polar cloud caps and glaciers and we do the same process and for that works the same way we can't just subtract out the clutter but the only way to do that quantitatively is to have parallel tracks that are offset um, a little bit and then do basically like an interfer interferometry um, and uh, so that's really difficult to do in the airplane in terms of reflying the lines precisely offset um, but that's something that we're looking into trying. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, guys. We're starting to, uh, uh, we're at an, uh, an hour and five minutes so far. Uh, so maybe one or two more questions. I know people will probably be starting to drop off. Uh, Willie Armstrong, you've got one. Do you want to pose it? Um, yeah, thanks. So we uh, just, again, really nice talks to both of you. Um, and Daniel, this consensus ice thickness product has been really great. Um, we've been using it in our own uh, research. So it's a super cool thing to share with the community. Um, 
I had one more question about uncertainty. People were asking about uncertainty and velocity and things like that um, and the intermodal spread, but how do you deal with uncertainties in, in the like model mass balance or model climate data that's, that's going into the, at least some of these models, is that right? Mm. Yeah, they are, they're not uh, ex explicitly accounted for, like uh, at least not in the global data set. There we basically, in this cross-validation experiment that I was uh, alluding to earlier, uh, we try to diagnose how much is the uncertainty that we have, but we cannot backtrace where is it coming from. So yeah, no, there is no uh, sophisticated uh, way to handle that. Yeah. So there could be like bias and things like that in the mass balance field that varies across glaciers and and things like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I have one more question if, uh, if folks will listen to it. It's, it's geared a little more toward Jack, although hopefully it can involve Daniel too. So Jack, in your, uh, for your surveys of bag, uh, of uh, Bering Glacier and uh, Humboldt, those are kind of the dream, right? Because you can go back and forth across ice flow. And I know from our ice sheet surveys that those are often preferred for mass conserving approaches. Mm -hmm. um, so, but how how does the conversation go between you and and people who want to model glacier flow because you know the 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 bearing is nice and wide right and you have a relatively slow plane so you can actually make those turns but for a lot of other glaciers i mean what do you say like because mountains i can't do that uh how does uh, how, how do you reconcile what what other people might be interested in in terms of ice thickness measurements versus what is possible yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, for, for some of the smaller glaciers, we really have not been able to get anything. Um, but again, part of the problem is we're, we're piggybacking on the LIDAR flights. Mm -hmm. and we often just don't have the time and the resources to add additional flights just for radar, at least part of the OIB work that we've had. Um, I think in some cases you could probably fly them cross, cross flow at a higher elevation. Yeah. Um, you know, we've, we've learned that you don't necessarily have to be super low. Um, and so I would like to try more of that if I get the opportunity or if we do, um, maybe even this coming summer. The other, the other option is this, um, basically repeat pass or side by side tracks, um, which mm -hmm. I've been talking with John Payton at Kansas about how we should do those and process those. And I think that has a lot of potential to make that work for the smaller ones where you yeah flying down the center line just does not work Excellent. like even uh, the example i showed for logan i mean that's a pretty big glacier you know yeah. so um i think that would be a good place to try the cross track repeat lines yeah okay i think i'll leave the, we'll leave the last question for uh for jack from uh daniel you going to the himalayas jack Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Flying airplanes at, at those altitudes uh, can be quite challenging, but uh, would, would really like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you help make arrange that? <laughs> yeah, we would probably need a different aircraft, right? Nah, yeah. probably not. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, I think, yeah, we've, we've done some pretty high flights up around Denali and uh, in the wrangles that that work fine but you just need oxygen okay cool uh well thank you everyone uh we've gone over time but uh thank you everyone for participating daniel and jack great uh presentations and discussion it was really uh informative uh that and so uh thank you all for attending uh our next uh our next meeting will probably be in early april we're uh hoping to recruit, recruit some stuff uh some folks who are um uh, modeling uh, glacier flow uh, at sort of global scale. So we're probably uh, hitting up some of Daniel's colleagues again and uh, to uh, discuss that. So stay tuned for that. And uh, we've got Caitlin and I have uh, more plans for later on in the year as well for uh, conversations to have. So thank you again, everyone. And yeah. uh, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thank you. Cheers, all. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.